Great. Thanks so much, Kevin. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, alongside Annie. Uh, we've loved the remarks from the prior speakers and are just delighted to um, share a little bit about some of the world that we play in, which really is kind of the venture capital space, looking at the realm of investments and entrepreneurs. I'm joined by Annie Lamont, the uh, founding uh, co-founder and managing partner of uh, Oak, uh, nearly a $2 billion uh, assets under management venture capital fund. Annie, maybe just to kick us off, could I uh, ask you to give us a brief introduction and share with us maybe one area or one trend that you're particularly excited about in the moment? Sure. Thanks, Dave. Good to be here with you and all those people I can't see. Um, so I will make it quick, but I just <laughs> want to say that, that healthcare is personal to me. I'm a small town girl from Wisconsin, went to Stanford University, and actually had to drop out my junior year because my father became ill had no health insurance, and he was self-employed. Um, I did get back there when he cashed in his life insurance for his senior year and um, was in Silicon Valley and at the time that the um, entrepreneurial revolution began uh, with Apple and Genentech and some other great companies. So I've really been a venture capitalist my entire career. But healthcare is very personal given my experience, um, and I've been focused on it ever since. Um, we founded the firm OKHCFT in the last decade to focus on healthcare and fintech. Um, there's a lot of overlap between payments and healthcare. And we fund entrepreneurs all the way from early to late, um, late growth. Um, so, you know, any size check uh, is really all about the idea, the impact of the mm -hmm. innovation, the fact, you know, does it lower costs and improve the quality of healthcare? As for themes, um, there's so many we're interested in, but one theme in particular that we've gone deep in over the last decade is primary care. And if you start with, we were the Series A investor in One Medical, um, so proud of them and um, pleased with the IPO recently. Um, but we've invested in five other companies also, in addition mm. to One Medical, because we think that primary care is the gateway to the system. It should be uh, empowered to be the care coordination a vehicle for every uh, citizen in the United States. And, you know, I think we all know if you saw in the, you know, with COVID that you had to have a primary care doc in order to get a diagnostic test for COVID. So, you know, needing that prescription, I mean, we, we finessed that with uh, virtual care and teledoc and other means, but the reality is, is that 25 percent of the American public do not have a primary care physician. And frankly, 75 percent are not actually monitoring um, their patients care um, in a care coordinated way. So we are all in uh, Village MD is another company we invested in in that space, <laughs> uh, which recently announced its uh, $1 billion investment from Walgreens. Uh, Tom Lee's Galileo. Uh, Tom Lee was the founder of One Medical, uh, you know, Jonathan Bush's Firefly. So we, we really believe that that is the way to manage healthcare in the future and focus on that as a, one of the principal uh, approaches. Thanks. That's a, that's a great answer. Um, you know, one of the things that's on my mind is the tension in the venture capital world, perhaps between what we'll call like the need for financial returns, but also mm -hmm. for patient outcomes. You know, one can imagine, and we've seen stories about, let's say, a private equity organization or even a venture capital firm coming in and, and driving up a, a P&L where people are, are pushing back and saying, well, shouldn't we really be thinking about patients? And so curious in your world, how do you, how do you reconcile? How do you balance those two elements? Um, as you think of it from you know, a pre-investment stage and maybe a post-investment stage. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, look, you don't go into venture capital to make money. You go into venture capital to transform the world and that's a positive change. So we literally have had a mantra for the last 20 years that every time we look at investment, it has to lower cost and improve quality or access. And so as we think about all the investments we've done in technology enabled services and solutions to payers, providers, pharma, employer, if it doesn't do that, we're not investing. Um, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you some examples. So if you think about, um, and I can tell you, this is not just um, a mission. It's, a, it's, a, it's a great for my LPs and investors too, because then you're always on the right side of history. You're always on the right side of the law. You're always on the right side of regulation, regulation in the future. Um, and so it's been a winning strategy. We've literally not had one company affected by a stroke of the pen change uh, mm -hmm. in Washington you know, or in the state. Um, and so, you know, we don't like, we wouldn't do a derm roll up, you know, we're not, we're not aggregating specialty groups in order to be able to consolidate pricing power and leverage 
with payers or with anyone else. That is not a game. That is a great way to make money, perhaps, but that is not a winning strategy as far as we're concerned. That's a great answer. Um, you had mentioned earlier something at the intersection of uh, kind of healthcare and financial tech, which is obviously a big focus of your of your firms, um, and this idea of maybe payment reform. Um, do you want to take a moment and share with us what are some of the opportunities you see there going forward? Again, probably analyze that from an investment perspective, but at the end of the day, as you said, I think we do want to change the world. We do want to make kind of the, the consumer marketplace um, as well as the payer provider side easy. So curious what you think might be uh, uh, coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there, I'll take this in two directions. One is, um, you know, with COVID, we saw an amazing amount of behavior change, and that's the hardest thing in healthcare, in anything, is to have behavior yeah. change. Um, and that was the most, one of the most important things that came out of it is obviously, you know, virtual medicine, you know, happened. Um, you know, we think about all the trends that we're investing in home care, virtual, virtualization, uh, primary care, mental health, social determinants of health. All of these things were accelerated during COVID. Um, and from our perspective, that's a good thing because those are the right trends for America. In order to sustain those trends, you have to have uh, payment reform. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about the way we pay now, um, you know, two parts of this. One, obviously for telehealth, the changes that were made in order to reimburse telehealth in the same way as a, an in-person visit, you know, have to remain. Um, and you know, there may be tweaks about how that's done, but that's incredibly important you know, going forward. Um, but the other thing that has to change is the payment reform across the entire system. And that is that, you know, when we, when we think about primary care and other approaches, taking risk, we need to take, you know, be, we need to have provider systems that at some level take risk because you have to be responsible for the total cost of care and the quality of care simultaneously. And that is really the only way we're going to change the system. You know, a fee for system, fee for service system going forward is something we've been talking about you know, for a while, but that's the change that we need to accelerate in order to accelerate payment reform. I mean, there are things you know, that can be done incrementally along the way, um, but I, you know, obviously groups like, like Village that do take global risk on a population are the way that we're gonna like, dramatically impact the quality of care and the cost of care. Um, there are certainly things from the, you know, the, in the intersection of fintech and, and healthcare, we think about obviously rev cycle management is one of those. All of these, you know, healthcare benefit HSAs, FSAs. How do we do more, you know, with that? Um, but it's really, a, you know, something like UDA that is thinking about how do you put the responsibility of payment um, uh, collection from the consumer onto the payer and take it off the provider? Because the reality is, is you know, I as a patient may be going to seven different providers in a year who could possibly track you're not you know you're not going to download an app for every one of those you're not going to be dealing with the you know having to deal with all these different providers the information the payer is giving you in terms of what you owe as a consumer is 30 percent of the times different than what the provider is saying <laughs> so when, you know Uda is enabling the payers to actually do that collection to monitor and have a different relationship with the provider and i think that's you know however that's done that is something that needs to change. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, something I like to do is occasionally some uh, a technique I'll call a lightning round. And so with your blessing, I'm just going to ask you a couple super quick rapid fire questions. Um, drum roll, do, 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 here we go. All right. So in a pandemic, dot, 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 in a pandemic, go. In a pandemic, it would be great to have leadership in Washington that would uh, actually consolidate testing and uh, and provide support on PPE, you know, in a pandemic um, and thoughtful leadership about mandating mask wearing. How's, how's Absolutely. That? Northwell Health should. Northwell Health should continue to invest in innovation and work with innovators uh, and should be driving costs from primary care up. How's that? Taking risk. <laughs> a great board member always. A great board member always listens. Mm. Entrepreneurs frequently. Entrepreneurs frequently. So many <laughs> things frequently. Um, entrepreneurs frequently uh, oversell. You know mm. what? No, but you know what? That's essential to actually get to the final goal. So I we forgive them for that. I hate it when. 
I hate it when. Um, I hate it when you know what the right answer is and you can't get there because there are so many institutional uh, legacy challenges to getting some a, a problem, solving a problem in the way we all know it should be solved. Two more. President Trump should. President Trump should. Well, um, President, <laughs> I, I, I'll go back to my first response and that we need national consistent national messages on what we need to do as a nation. You know, this virus knows no borders. And my last question, my family thinks that. My family thinks that. Um, my family thinks uh, that COVID, what has been an unbelievable tragedy for um, so many in America, um, but that it has been an amazing um, experience to be together, to be to have been together as a family, um, and to slow down. Thanks for the lightning round. Those were amazing, amazing answers. Um, so we're we're coming to the end of our session, and so maybe what I want to do is uh, ask you kind of one final question as we sum up um, the conversation. Um, obviously, COVID is going to have um, some permanent, maybe some temporary elements to it. As you look ahead. Um, are you able to maybe make a, a prediction or maybe guide us in terms of what do you think some of the lasting legacy of COVID might be, uh, say, two, three, four years from now? Yeah, I think the, the lasting legacy is that um, virtualization and home, co home care are going to change dramatically. And mm -hmm. if you think about the sophistication around home, we've always had the technology we, you know, healthcare is not void of technology, at least from a system delivery, information, aggregation, management perspective. It's really more will. Um, and I would say that nobody, I, nobody wants to be in a nursing home, for example, the last three months, we've learned that. Um, and I think if you look at like, our nursing homes in Connecticut are down 25% and nobody's going in. Um, and I think it will dramatically um, uh, shift and accelerate the, the change and sophistication of what we're doing in the home. Mm. And I think it's incredibly exciting from, you know, from point of care testing all the way to just uh, core management of $12 caregivers in the home. We're going to be empowering them in a different way to keep people um, out of the ER, um, even out of urgent care, you know, manage and, and have more predictability about um, and forethought in terms of uh, you know their health status. Thank you so much, Annie. That was uh, amazing. I know our time has come to an end, but um, I'm so grateful to you for sharing your views at the intersection of investing, healthcare, and technology. Thank you to Northwell Health for having us, um, and we look forward to enjoying the rest of the program alongside everybody else. Thanks, Thanks. again, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, Northwell.